and you are listening to The Narrow Gate. The, today's teaching is going to be the one and done gospel in generational curses. And we are very thankful that Matthew Morton was able to take the time in his busy schedule and just give us a little bit of his wisdom, a little bit of his insight and teaching in the areas of deliverance. He's got a very strong anointing and the good thing about it all is he shares with us that if we're in Christ, we all have that blessing to deliver those that are captive and in bondage. And so we just ask that you would sit back, relax, and enjoy the show. for listening to the narrow gate um i have matthew morton with me and i met matthew morton uh back when he was doing a uh a ministry in one of our local home churches he's got an international ministry and he travels all around the world and ministers to lots and lots of people um he's very, he's got a very good uh teaching skill he's a gifting and uh, I'm really, really excited to see what Matthew has to talk about today. Um, some the teaching for today is going to be the one and done gospel and general curses that are passed down the family line. So I'm just going to leave it to Matthew and go from there. So, um, with the generational curses, um, it's an interesting topic because in the Old Testament, God laid out specific laws for his people. And, um, you know, he would say things like, do this, but whatever you do, don't do this. You know, there's literally these laws that say things like, do not sleep with this person, this family member, do not try and steal your neighbor's wife. And it like outlines very specific detail and it's kind of like, almost awkward some of it what it outlays like it literally says things like don't sleep with an animal don't do this don't do that like it's really clear and uh it says if you do this a curse will come upon you if you do this a curse will come upon you and it says that i will visit the sons of the fathers to the fourth generation so basically the curse ends up on one person and then it's there for four generations so the interesting thing is that in Christian circles, people consider that anybody who has demons as having a generational curse. But the interesting thing is you can have a spirit of um, anger and rage because you sin all the time and you get angry all the time and you partnered with that spirit, but not necessarily be cursed. Yeah, And so the Bible doesn't say if you have a demon, you are cursed. Like Jesus didn't walk around saying to every single person who had demons, you're cursed, you're cursed, you're cursed, you're cursed. He just said, demon, come out, demon, come out, demon, come out. So the way the Bible paints it is that having demons is actually a normal human condition because the human race was literally under the ownership of Satan. Now, most Christians never hear that in church. They just hear like, God loves you. God is love. We just need to keep loving people. And they hear these, you know, super fairy tale messages and they never hear anything like Satan used to own your soul before you were saved. We will get back to this episode in a moment. We just wanted to take the time to talk about Eden's Promise Naturals, my wife's company. She makes artisan soap with essential oils, lip balm, and even my personal favorite, beard oils. She prays over everything she makes and each soap is scripture inspired and comes with a scroll printed on plantable seed paper. They are a great gift to encourage someone. Take a look at www.edenspromisenaturals.com or find her company on Facebook or Instagram. Thank you very much. Right now, yeah. he's, got, he's got a legal right to your family and that includes putting demons in them, really. And uh, if you don't believe me, you just have to look at when Jesus had a conversation with Satan. Satan said, if you bow down and do what I ask you to do, like if you literally worship me, 
I will give you all the people and all the kingdoms of this world. So Jesus didn't say, what are you talking about? You're on drugs. You're crazy, Satan. They're not your people. They're never your people. They're my people. He never said they weren't his people. He never argued the case. He, um, <clears throat> he didn't. Satan wasn't lying. The human race belonged to him. They were in his hands because of the fall, the fall of man. <laughs> remember, Bible says, remember the heights from which you have fallen. You know, people don't realize yeah. the, the heights from which we've fallen. Yeah, I mean, it says, the, uh, it says that about the devil. The yeah. yeah. It says that about the devil too. But the point is, people don't realize how far the human race fell. People have this idea that mankind sinned, got kicked out of this place that was like heaven, and got sent to a middle ground that was called earth. They don't realize that, no, actually you're born on a path to hell unless you're saved off it. You're, you're like the human race is just as fallen as the demons unless you get redeemed. And that's why, you know, humans that are unredeemed end up in the same place as the demons because they're just as fallen as demons. So um, it's interesting. We have a joke for really naughty kids. We go, that kid's so naughty. He's such a brat that I don't know whether to cast the demon out of the boy or the boy out of the demon. And uh, mm -hmm. what, what we're saying is we're not sure which one's more of a problem, the demons and the kid or the kid and the demons. <laughs> Okay, so I have a question for you. So when how do you, how can you tell when there's a when there's a demon manifesting in somebody or when it's just a generational curse? Is there specific things that you see? Is there things that the Holy Spirit just uh, um, gives to you? You know how how does it work? That's a good question. So um, when we're doing the deliverance, um, curses that are there actually uh, surface. So let's just say, for example, that a voodoo practitioner was paid money to put a curse on you when you're in holidays in like Haiti or like, you know, Nicaragua or somewhere where they do voodoo. Or let's yeah. just say you had a witch doctor put a curse on you and you were cursed by that witch doctor. And that, they'll do that to anyone for money. Now, um, what that does is uh, the witch, let's just say she has, a witch often has um, a lot of demons. Like I recently delivered a witch, she had 99 demons, or it might have been 98. Yeah, 98 demons she like? had. It, she nearly, it looked like she nearly died. At one point she fell to the ground choking, couldn't breathe. It was kind of scary for everyone who was there because we're thinking, is this lady going to be able to breathe? The demons were choking her as they were yeah. manifesting. And eventually they came out and uh, everything was okay. And I was, I was glad because I've never had anybody really, you know, hurt during a deliverance. And I've delivered over a thousand people in the last couple of years. And, uh, you know, I really don't want anyone to ever be hurt or killed for that matter. Because, you know, there's not really insurance policies that you can get to protect you. You, you know, in a court of law, they'll say you killed her because you did some uh, strange ritual. <laughs> you would get all the blame for doing what the demon did. And that has happened. The Catholic Church has had multiple people die during deliverances. Uh, Emily Rose yeah. died. Emily Rose died during a deliverance, and there's recordings of her manifesting really badly demons. Because the uh, the priests tend to think it's kind of like a ritual to get it out. And uh, the Catholic priests, what they do, they don't actually cast demons out. A lot of the time, what they do is they taunt the demon by throwing holy water at it and talking about, you know, coming out, but they don't have the power and the anointing, the authority. So, uh, you know, they don't have the baptism of the Holy Spirit with power. They just have like a bunch of religious rituals. So they're trying to put prayer beads on them and holy water on them. And the demons, you know, manifesting and manifesting to the point where the person ends up seriously injured or dead, mm -hmm. um, which kind of scares people from doing deliverance. I had someone say you shouldn't do it because people have died from it. You know? And it's like, well, yeah. people don't die from it the way that we do it. People are saved and delivered. Um, so, um, back to your question, um, how do you tell if there's a curse during the deliverance, the spirit of witchcraft will, will actually manifest and it will actually say things like, I'm here under a contract. I have a contract on this family. All right. Who made the contract? And it'll, it'll say like, they went to a fortune teller or they went to a witch. So often it comes up during the deliverance that there is a curse. And then to break the curse, we get them to renounce any involvement that they had. 
So if they had a specific involvement, like they, they went to a witch for help, we say, I repent of going to any kind of um, fortune teller or medium or new age Reiki practitioner. I repent of doing that. You know, I cover it in the blood of Jesus Christ. It doesn't matter whether you knew it was wrong, whether you didn't know it was wrong. It doesn't, regardless, sin is a sin regardless of whether you knew how bad it was. Yeah. Like, you know, if somebody murders somebody and thinks it's justified, you know, it's still murder and you still repent before God. You don't, you know, whether it's first degree or second degree, it doesn't matter. It's, it's exactly. just, you just repent. So you don't make a big deal over whether you should or shouldn't repent of things and you just do it. It's quick and easy. Just go, God, in the name of Jesus, I'm sorry. I repent from everything wrong that I've done. And uh, after they repent, what happens is the contract that demon has is torn up. It, it's broken. So we'll pray in the blood in the blood of Jesus Christ. We cancel that contract because she has now repented. And you have no legal right to be here now, you demon. And it will even admit that it no longer has a legal right to be there. And then you say, you spirit of witchcraft that entered through the curse, I command you to come out now. And if you don't cast out the demon, the curse still stands. Okay. So that, that, that gets a bit of a gray area. Some people think they can just say, I renounce the curse and it's all gone. Um, not many demons are going to come out just because you renounce something or repented. But again, it's not impossible. We've seen people renounce and repent where the demon starts coughing out of their mouth as they're repenting, as yeah. they're renouncing. So uh, I guess from my experience, we find maybe 5% of people are getting delivered from demons just by repenting and renouncing. But the other 90 to 95% of people, they really need to ha have someone actually cast that demon out. Yeah. And uh, we often find self-deliverance is not uh, extremely effective because the person usually thinks there's only one or two spirits or four or five, but they never suspect that actually there's many, many more spirits. Yeah. So a lot of people think they're delivered because two or three demons come out of them, or they had a deliverance session where five or six demons came out of them. And then they still have a lot of problems in their life. Oh, they still have the anxiety. They still have the depression. They still have the panic attacks. And you know what they think? They think, oh, that deliverance didn't work. No, yeah. it does work, but you only got five out and there's still 100 there or there's still 25 there. Yeah. So to be honest, people don't usually believe that a person has 100 spirits or 50 spirits. Uh, Christians usually believe if they do have a demon, it might be one, two, three, or four. But they have no idea that the way the devil works, he, he he sends gangs of demons like the mafia. The devil works like a mafia mob boss. There's mm -hmm. gangs of spirits. They work in gangs. It's it's rarely just, you know, you're not going to find one demon in a person. Yeah. Even in the Bible, Mary Magdalene didn't have one demon. She had seven. Yeah. You know? And Jesus said when one leaves, it comes back and brings seven and more. So yeah. they work in large groups. So people are shocked. I mean, I had a politician come to me in Canada and he was a Christian man. And he said, I need deliverance from a sex demon. And obviously he was getting bombarded with sexual thoughts and perversion thoughts and things. And he yeah. was almost, he almost cheated on his wife with some lady, but he didn't. And uh, he'd still broken, you know, sits to have done sins in all kinds of other areas. And so I said, all right, let's repent. So this guy came to me saying he had one demon. We prayed, 82 demons came out. Oh, jeez. <laughs> So people just have, they just have no idea how many spirits they've got hanging on. They just, just have no idea. And it's not until you get right into deliverance that you start to discover that, wow, people are literally packed with demons. Like it's, it's a shocking revelation when you realize, and uh, people can listen to this, say you're a pastor from a church or you're just a very active Christian or a leader. You could be thinking, this is total garbage. This guy doesn't know what he's talking about. Well, we've we've seen we've seen thousands and thousands and thousands of demons come out of people in like twenty different countries. So, what I'm saying is, you would need to do it for a while before you saw what I'm saying will happen. Like Jesus actually said at one point, um, if you want to know that all my teachings are really from God, go out and do them, and then you will know for sure that these teachings are from God. Yeah. So he's saying there is evidence for what I'm teaching you. There's total proof. But the only way to find out that there's total proof is to go and apply it to your life and try it, and you'll see. Okay. So I have another question. So you mentioned as far as Catholicism is concerned and their way of casting out a demon. What, you know, 
in in what you you know practice and you know as far as in the Lord, what is the uh, the strength the strength come from besides the Holy Spirit? Meaning, you know, where does the authority lie? It would be the question as opposed yeah. to what Catholicism they use rituals. Yeah. So the real power uh, is knowing your authority that you have in Christ and the power and the anointing that you get from the Holy Spirit. You can't fake an anointing, you know. So if you, if you get an atheist to come and pray for demons to come out, you know what's going to happen? The demon's going to say, Paul, I know, Jesus, I know, but who are you? Yeah. You're nobody. You're nobody. You, you don't have the power of the Holy Spirit. You don't have anything. And, and, and you know what happens in the Bible? There's seven sons of Sceva. They got beaten up to pieces. Black and, and blue. Yeah. And, I mean, you have to get beaten up extremely badly for your clothes to be ripped off you. And, and I mean torn. I mean, it's not like he took the shirts off neatly. <laughs> they were ripped <laughs> off them. It was a yeah. severe, severe beating. And... Um, the funny thing is that was a deliverance gone wrong. And you know what happened later? Ephesus went into massive revival and all the witches burned their witchcraft as a direct result of the yeah. seven sons of Sceva. So mm -hmm. one failed deliverance led to a citywide revival. And it wasn't only the Jews. There was um, just Greeks there that were unbelievers and they got saved as well. And they mm -hmm. came and repent they repented of all their witchcraft. All yeah. because of the demons knowing who Jesus was, the demon confirmed that Jesus Christ was really the Messiah and that Paul was too. Mm -hmm. Yeah, not to mention, a, you know, that territorial demon or authority that was over that area was pushed back as well. And that was, you know, very apparent. Exactly. So uh, what was your question? How, where does the real power come from? Um, yes, exactly. So um, the word of God says uh, in Luke ten nineteen, it says, I have given you power and authority. So they're two different things. Um, power and authority. I've given you two things over all the works of the devil. So to destroy the works of the devil, you need two things. Power, which is dunamis in Greek, and authority, which is uh, exousia in Greek. Now, a policeman has a gun, which would represent power. Mm -hmm. uh, and when, it, when, it, when the gunpowder goes off, the bullet goes flying, the gunpowder explodes, right? The word dunamis yeah. is actually similar to the word dynamite. It comes from the same root word for dynamite. So that would be power. And then, um, you know, authority is actually just who he is. He is a policeman. The, the law, if someone breaks the law, he is allowed to to put you in handcuffs and throw you into a prison. Yeah. He can do he can do things that other people can't do. You know, if somebody else put you in handcuffs and threw you into prison, you could probably sue them. But if yeah. a cop throws you in prison and puts you in cuffs, he's allowed to do it, especially if he did something, you know, really wrong. So my point is a policeman is given authority by the government, by the people. He's given authority to do his job. Now Christians yeah. have been given authority by Jesus Christ to do our job to destroy the works of the devil and bring the kingdom of God. Yes. And so in order to bring the kingdom of God, sometimes we have to take ground of the enemy because the, the enemy, again, he's, he's basically owning their souls. So, you know, we have to destroy the kingdom of the devil every time we want to bring someone into the light because mm -hmm. we're, you know, we're taking someone off him. Every time someone gets saved, we're taking someone off Satan's kingdom. Mm -hmm. And yeah, the demons get... in that person... And not yeah. to be happy about. I guess you could say that we are ambassadors to the kingdom of heaven towards to the nations. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. So uh, as an ambassador, we have the legal authority from our nation, which is the kingdom of heaven, to uh, to enact the king's orders. And so um, power and authority is needed. And I always say if someone's driving down the street, they're driving 100 kilometers an hour and the speed limit 60, or let's say miles. If the police pulls you over and you pay the fine, that's you responding to the policeman's authority. But if you resist arrest, even though the policeman has authority, real authority, demons will still try to resist arrest. So even though you're resisting arrest, then the policeman can't use his, his authority because you're ignoring his authority. So what does he do? He pulls out a gun, he pulls out some cuffs, he pulls out some electricity to zap you or some pepper spray in the eyes. So he's going to use force, which is power. He's going to use power to overpower you. 
So that's that's what we have with demons. We can make them come out because of the authority. And if they don't listen to the authority and they try and ignore our authority, then we've been given power to deal with them, to force them out. And so the main way to notice the difference, if, if, if you go to pray for a person for deliverance and you say, in the name of Jesus Christ, I take authority over every evil spirit, come out of this person now. If they start manifesting and coughing up demons straight away, that demon is responding to your authority because it's quickly listening and obeying. Yeah. If the demon is ignoring you and trying to hide and then just manifesting and manifesting and kicking and screaming, that is a sign of a demon trying to ignore your authority. It doesn't mean you don't have authority. It means the demon's trying to ignore your authority. And that that is when you need to use the power of the Holy Spirit and say, I command you to come out by the power of the Holy Spirit. Yeah. And you can actually forcibly, but it usually takes just that little bit longer. And uh, it's very normal for deliverance to take 15, 20, 25 minutes. And it's very normal for deliverance to take 45 minutes to an hour, an hour and a half. Mm -hmm. uh, when, it, when it starts to get to an hour to an hour and a half, I'm saying to the person usually, hey, there's a reason these haven't come out um, because you've got some agreement with this spirit. So let's search for that agreement. Otherwise, we could just be here for 10 hours. Now, yeah. amateur, amateurs that don't know any better, they'll just keep praying and they'll keep rebuking demons and the demon will just manifest for 10 hours until everyone's lost their voice and they're all exhausted. And then they will give up and the demon wins. It gets to stay there. Mm -hmm. So what we'll do is we'll actually say, hey, what legal right does this demon have to be here? And some people say legal rights aren't in the Bible. Well, they are. They're just not called that. You know, you've got to ask the question, where is it in the Bible? Not, you can't just say it's not in there. You've got to ask, where is it in the Bible? Well, I'm glad you asked. And then you, sh and then you can show them. There's a scripture that says, if you listen to a false preacher in Corinthians, if you listen to a false gospel from a false teacher, it says, you will receive a different spirit, small s, yeah. to the spirit you've already received, big S. So it tells us, even though you've received the Holy Spirit, capital S, you're still in danger of receiving an evil spirit after receiving the Holy Spirit. So it's sort of like blinders. Yeah, exactly. So let's just say the false prophet comes to town and he's moving in a particular spirit called the spirit of error, which is mentioned in the Bible, by the way, the spirit of error. Um, so let's just say you believed his little false teaching. Now you're in danger of receiving a spirit of error because the Holy Spirit can't, brood over that word to perform it. The Bible says the Holy Spirit broods over his word to perform it. But if it's not his word, he can't brood over that word. He can't, he has nothing to perform. He can't show up. So a good example would be I had a friend doing Alcoholics Anonymous or just a guy we knew. And uh, they said to him, you know, your God can be anything. It can be a lamp. It can be a table. It can be, a <laughs> yeah, you just, your higher power can be an apple. Yeah. Or it could be Jesus. It's really up to you. And uh, they thought that they could still get the drug addicts off drugs and it, and it would be harmless for them to just pick any God. Now, this is really serious because what they're doing, even though it seems to, to some people that seems harmless, but they're doing mm -hmm. something very dangerous. They're saying that the son of God who was crucified, who's the only way to freedom, they're saying he's not the only way. There's so many other ways that you can be set free from alcohol, set yeah. free from addiction. But the addiction is actually a demon, and Jesus is the only one that's going to set you free from the addiction demon. Yeah, and exactly. so what happened to this friend of mine from Vancouver Island up in Canada is because they preached a false gospel, which is that, you know, any God can save you basically, and even an apple, because they preached this false gospel, he had a false encounter. He, he actually thought it was like a born again experience, but later on realized that it was a false awakening. It was like a new age, false yeah. Jesus. It was like a new age Jesus. And there's a demon that calls itself Jesus. And it's uh, not at all Jesus. It's totally demonic. Mm -hmm. oh, the Bible mentions it. It says you will receive, you can receive a different Jesus which is incredible if you think about that, because how would Paul have known there's other beings getting around calling themselves Jesus? I don't think he actually did know that. I think the Holy Spirit literally spoke through him and, and wrote the words, you can mm -hmm. receive 
another Jesus, like a different Jesus, because there's yeah. no way Paul, there's no way Paul would have known those demons getting around calling themselves Jesus. I mean, he might have, but um, I don't think he did. I think that was like totally Holy Spirit inspired for our benefit later. Yeah, yeah, especially there's a uh, you know a lot of people in the in the New Age movements and stuff like that who you know have ast astral project and they have um, these out of body experiences and they talk to spirit guides and some of the spirit guides actually sort of look like a cosmic Jesus and they also yeah, 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 yeah. they call themselves Jesus and they're like I can be your spirit guide so they accept that spirit guide. You know, and then they start giving them like false revelations and things like that. And it's, it's yeah. very common. You know, there's lots of books, you know, from people that said they, you know, have been spoken to by a cosmic Jesus. Yeah, absolutely. You're exactly right. And uh, I've seen that as well. And uh, it's very interesting. So, what's sad is that when you go to a church that's kind of like run like a cult, they get up and they preach a different Jesus, and the whole crowd gets full of, um, a different Jesus. Like, actually, someone that is a mutual friend of ours, who I won't name, went to a church and she saw a Jesus standing over the people with no holes in his hands. And she looked at it and she realized that's not Jesus Christ of the Bible. This Jesus yeah. that these, these people have is a different Jesus. And they, yeah. you know, the people there are receiving a different spirit. And it's really sad, yeah. Sometimes we'll find a church where the whole church is packed with spirits of religion, condemnation, judgment, all these legalistic religious spirits, and they're teaching it from the pulpit, and everyone's opened their heart up to this false teaching, legalism, and then next thing you know, they're all bound by the same demons. So I guess if you can imagine it like this, if you're a picture person, imagine Satan comes along and he sees a church and he says, which attack will work for this church? And the Bible says, no weapon forged against you shall prosper. Now, the mm. word forged, what it means is custom made. Something forged is something that's handmade. So yeah. the, the devil is, is hand-making, custom-making, forging a specific demonic attack against you or against your family or against your church that he thinks will work to put you in bondage to his kingdom. Yeah, so that's, and so that's I know personally. Okay. <laughs> I Some know people personally. don't hear it. Huh? Some people don't want to hear it. Yeah. Me personally, like um, before, you know, 2020 rolled around and stuff like that, I very much was starting to get into this concept of, you know, a false Jesus concept where it was more love based than um, foundational and. Um, I'm trying to think of the the, the term natural. And um and I think what happened was when twenty twenty rolled around in the past couple of years, I've been I've been it's been definitely an eye opener. And me, someone who came from the the new age movement for a period of time, when I came out of it, I was I was very much, you know, in a more um religious fashion to the point where I was almost condemning and, you know, very end times and stuff like that. And, you know, that stuff can go off into a, a different yeah. directional tangent. But it's it's weird because I went from one side, which is kind of false, to the other side, which is false. And then wow, so, and when, that's so true. when 2020 rolled around, it's just like, bam, all of a sudden I started seeing things and different churches and organizations and just people responding in ways that I didn't see before. And there were, there were many people that I looked up to and, and stuff like that. And I was just like, man, and it's like what the, and when I was secluded and when, when me and Corey were secluded, he took us on a, on a scripture trail and it was just like, we saw scripture after scripture after scripture. And it just sort of, you know, it just grounded us. And I'm just like, and we were just like, man, you know, so, you know, I can understand how, you know, deceiving things can be, you know, oh, and, yeah. uh, when, when you, know you just, what? when your t ears are tickled. You, you know what you're saying there, how deceiving things can be. I remember having the thought, what if Satan is like a hundred times more cunning than what we are? You know, what if he's like smarter than us, been around for thousands of years, seeing generation after generation after generation of people, 
Um, and I sort of got thinking, and I know God's power can keep us, you know, free and protected. And I'm aware that God looks after the elect and so on and the call of God. But I was just wondering about how deceptive the devil really is. And the Bible does warn a lot about deception, especially in the last days. And it says, yeah. you know, it even has a concern about the elect being deceived. And so uh, I was wondering about that. And then, and then um, God gave me a revelation that when I was a young man, I was, I was maybe only 12 years old. I had a dream and in the dream, and, and this was like one of the most supernatural dreams, probably the most supernatural dream I'd ever had. I mean, most of the time I was just having kind of like normal 12 year old flying dreams and going to school naked dreams or whatever they were. Yeah. And, uh, and so this dream, I was in this room and uh, four or five, I'm going to say five angels came floating through the ceiling. They, like they didn't need a door. They just went straight through the ceiling, down to the ground. And then they're still on the ground and they were all wearing these uh, fancy white robes and all of them glowed blue. Their skin was glowing blue. So their face, their arms, you know, anywhere. Even actually, even the fabric of their clothes was had a glue blow to it, which was coming from underneath. Yeah. And I was like amazed. And I'll tell you what was so deceiving about it. Not just the fact that they looked like angels. It was twice as deceptive as that. I felt what I thought was love and joy and peace and happiness, mm -hmm. um, you know, a hundred times stronger than I'd ever felt it before. And uh, I didn't think the devil could do that, you know, make you feel eu euphoric, almost like happiness and joy. Like I thought, you know, joy comes from God, not the devil. Yeah. But, but I guess it was probably like taking a hit of cocaine. You know, when someone takes a hit of cocaine, they don't go, oh, this is disgusting. I feel terrible. They go, wow, you know, your, your body releases all these endorphins and you go, I feel amazing and all the chemicals yeah. release, you know, and that's a drug. So if a drug like cocaine can make you feel amazing and wonderful or ecstasy, then of course the devil can do the same thing as what a drug can do. You know, he's more powerful than cocaine. And so uh, I, I thought it was a God encounter for about 10 years, like, an, an, you know, they were heavenly angels. And I remember the, the angels went to leave and they hadn't really said much. Yeah, they hadn't really said anything. And I grabbed one of them by the wrist and I said, give me something to remember you by. And it, and it drew what looked like an Egyptian scarab beetle on my, like around somewhere where my, the inside of my palm or wrist. Yeah, not palm. It was, it was on the wrist. And it was like a, yeah, it looked like a beetle, like a scarab beetle. And it was, it was actually, it was actually bright and shining, the blue. Same as them as the angels. Yeah. And I was convinced it was angels. It wasn't until I was about 21 and I met someone that does deliverance and she said, oh, that would have been an Egyptian spirit. That was probably Isis or spirit of Ra. And, and, and I thought, you know what, she might be right. So I started taking authority over Egyptian demons and I started naming them one by one. And I, at this point, you know, come out, you evil, unclean spirit. And I named Osiris. Come out, Osiris. And as I named that demon, my whole body just buzzed and buzzed like it was like, it was the crazy sensation of um, something being inside you. Like it was like energy inside you buzzing. And that happens yeah. to new age, it happens to new age people, all of them, like all of them. And they say, oh, did you feel that energy? Oh, did you feel that energy? And, yeah, and they, yeah. they're feeling energies come in and enter them and, and maybe even sometimes come out of them and come back into them. And they go, oh, that person has such a nice energy. Did you feel her energy? And they're going on and on and on about energies because they're feeling that buzzing sensation of a demonic presence, but they don't know it's a demonic presence. They are unaware. They just think it's like some kind of energy. Yeah. But. And that is not an energy. That's an actual demon spirit entering them. Yeah, it's very deceptive. Yeah, and so I had to renounce it later on and say, I renounce that mark, whatever it was that it drew on me, that it was planning for. I, I believe it was trying to recruit me to be some kind of like a new age witchcraft, witch doctor, because the Egyptians um, were very in the occult. A lot of their religion was very occultic. Yeah, like they did, they did a lot of human sacrificing. They had a belief that if um, they didn't human sacrifice people every single night, that Ra, the sun god, would die every time the sun set. Ra was dead, and they yeah. believed that it wouldn't rise again the next morning. He wouldn't be resurrected unless they killed people. So mm -hmm. the demonic the demonic trick was to get the people to sacrifice humans every single night. 
Yeah, it's horrible. It's very demonic. And, you know, demons are still obsessed with human sacrificing today, the 21st century in America. But, you know, no one's going to no one's gonna do it, like throw it in the fire like they do to Moloch, like in the Bible. <laughs> so what do they do? They go to an abortionist, and the abortionist, they, they don't give a baby, like, painkillers. They take, a, like, a piece of metal uh, with, with, like, uh, hands on it, and they crush the arm and the leg, and then they twist it in its little socket until it rips out, and then they pull it out. And they haven't given the baby any painkillers of any kind. And obviously their nervous system is functioning. And they crush the head and pull it out. It's really demonic. It's like a human sacrifice happening inside the mother. Yeah. And, you know, they. from what I understand, there was, there was like a battle in Texas as far as um, the, there was a Satanist organization um, down there. And they were uh, fighting to um, – what was it? They were fighting to – make abortions acceptable for their sacrifices um meaning to um for to do it for a mother or whatever to come in um uh, for you know for an abortion as a satanic ritual like they yeah. were literally wanting that to be acceptable and the court systems to allow that as a religious act or something along those lines since at the time abortion was still considered legal I'm not sure how things are going on in Texas as far as that's concerned right now, but at least that's what the organization was trying to do at the time. And there's there's some news articles and stuff like that that were actually talking about that yeah. uh, as well. Well, I think uh, abortion's illegal in Texas now unless there's yeah. a, a, real, like a, a, a problem with the mother or a problem with the baby that's serious um, because Texas is really anti-abortion and, uh, yeah. you know, when that law was overthrown, um, you know, they, they were just straight away, they were one of the first states to get rid of abortion. Yeah. So, yeah, I heard that as well, that the Satanists were saying, it's our religious right to be able to do this. It's our ritual. Yeah. It's kind of it's kind of weird how the, the darkness was just exposed. I mean, if you, if you, you know, it's right there out in the open, it's in the articles, you know, you, you can see it that they're fighting in the court systems for that. You know, the darkness is like exposed right before your eyes, you know, and, and, no, one, so and no one cares. And yeah, yeah no because he really pays attention. Yeah, because the Bible says that the God of this age has blinded the minds of the unbelievers. So it's literally like we're living in the matrix and these people are still plugged into the machine. Yeah, exactly. And um, I guess, you know, we were, we were talking about, you know, fall, false jesus's and you know new age and we were getting down this path so what exactly is the one and done gospel so the one and done gospel is the biggest false gospel in the world right now okay it's believed by more people than any other false gospel that's out there and basically it's where you try and put everyone on a big conveyor belt and say okay you believe okay you've been baptized you're good you're done um there's nothing more that Jesus can really do for you now because you've already got everything that Jesus has for you because you're a believer and you're saved. And, um, you know, the interesting thing is the Bible even says in Revelations that in the last days, people who are completely bound, and, and it means by demons, will actually proclaim freedom, like ministers of righteousness will actually proclaim freedom for everyone. You know, God wants to see you free while they themselves are very bound. So demonized people, basically in modern English, are going to be are going to be telling people how wonderfully free they can be, and they themselves are bound. And so um, they're telling people, you don't need deliverance from demons. You've already been saved. Yeah. You know, like we they teach like Jesus said, it is finished, and it's like, whoa, that's literally like a demon speaking right now because Jesus didn't say there's no battle to fight. He didn't say there's no demons to cast out. There's you no know, need to like, repent. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, yeah, it's almost like, oh, you know what else? You don't need to keep getting closer to Jesus and keep getting more holy. You don't have to keep repenting because it's the one and done gospel, right? It's like say five, say a few words, and 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 you're done. And then these pastors will tell people, don't go to his meetings because it's unbiblical. Don't go to his meetings because it's unbiblical. 
you know, God is your deliverer and he's already delivered you the moment that you became a believer. Light and darkness can't exist in the same place. Well, show me that in the Bible. Show me where in the Bible it says the Holy Spirit and a demon can't both be in a person at the same time. You know what? It doesn't say it anyway. You know, I mean, I get it. I get it that it sounds logical that if you have the Holy Spirit in you, there shouldn't be an evil dark spirit in you. But like, firstly, the dark spirit is not like, a second like powerful thing that's like God and then somehow it's in is in opposition like it's not like an opposite power to God it's like a tiny little like um, parasite it's it's not some big powerful thing and secondly in the book of Job it says that Satan presented himself in the holy of holies right up there where God and the angels are and uh, stood there with all of the angels and God said what have you been doing and he says walking up and down on my real estate I've got this lovely place called Earth, and I've been walking to and fro, inspecting my land, you know, looking at all my people, you know, and yeah. making all my plans. And, and uh, people don't seem to understand that pure darkness in the form of Satan can and does operate right in and around light. He was, mm-hmm. in, he was in the throne of God, and that's after he'd fallen. So, you know, this idea that darkness somehow can't go near light is just a childish story that's not biblical at all and it has no basis in scripture anywhere. And it's uh, it's like a wives' tale. We call it a wives' tale. Someone made it up and then everyone else just passed it on uh, with no scriptural backing. Uh, a good example, one scripture says, do not let the sun go down on your anger, and it's written to Christians, and then it says, or give a foothold to the devil. Do not give place to the devil. It's literally telling you if you're a Christian and you don't forgive and you brood on this anger and you let these dark feelings kind of build, you are giving place to Satan. What is Satan going to do if you give him place and space? What do you think he's going to do? He's going to send a demon that's going to come straight in. That's what the Bible's telling you. In no uncertain terms, it's saying the demons will come in, the devil will come into your life. That's what it's saying. Mm-hmm. Yeah, another Not guy said it was going to end up with a root of bitterness. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. And it can get worse. The Bible talks about a root of bitterness. It also says if you're an unforgiving servant and you, and you refuse to forgive someone, you will be thrown into a prison where there are tormentors. And theologians are so smart, they think that that means hell. But it actually is talking about you will become demonized and you will be in a prison. And the prison is being demonized. You're in a prison, you can't live free. You're a slave. You're a slave to lust, or you're a slave to perversion, or you're a slave to anger, or if you're a slave to cigarettes or alcohol or drugs or whatever it is, and you can't actually get free. Yeah. So you know, someone who's go ahead. I was just going to say someone who's a drug addict or an alcoholic for a long time. Anyone can see with their own two eyes this person is not living in freedom. Yeah. This person is completely controlled by alcohol or drugs. And uh, what, what we can't see with our eyes is that the, the same thing is true of any sin. It has the same effect of the drug addict or the alcoholic. It puts you in chains that you just can't see. Yeah. Now, I have a question for you. You know, if, with the one and done gospel and when you go out and evangelize and, and minister to people and stuff like that, uh, would you say that's you know, one of the hardest, you know, types of gospels to, you know, minister to, because it almost, in a way, sounds sort of like a religious kind of a thing, even though that it's not. You know, I I know that, you know, the a religious spirit can operate in both ends of the spectrum, you know. Yeah. Yeah. So, I mean, how, how is it uh, ministering to somebody, you know, uh, uh, an individual, you know, who yeah. just has that one and done gospel yeah. concept? Yeah, I mean, the true answer is that everybody is different. So thank God for that, because um, some people um, can be completely stubborn and they have strongholds. And then other people can actually have a bit of humility about them and they can hear the truth and they can kind of realize that, yeah, some people can realize that they were sort of maybe a little deceived. Um, Mm -hmm. I mean, there's a deliverance lady getting around Los Angeles right now, getting big crowds and flying all over the world. and. you know, she started out just as a super lukewarm Christian and uh, she she just readily admits it. She's like, I was a lukewarm Christian. You know, I just lived how I wanted. She was someone probably that was made by the one and done gospel. Say some words, read the book, attend a church. Very good. Pat you on the back. And then um, 
thank God, you know, she broke out of that apathy and now she's casting out demons all over the world. And yeah, uh, she, awesome. she, still has, she still has more to learn, but she's on the right track. Uh, she's only been doing it for a few years. And so sometimes she'll only cast one or two demons out of the first one. They have like 20 or 30 and think that they're all gone because she's not really aware that there's actually so many more layers. Mm -hmm. uh, I guess you could you could think of it like this. A lot of people are like an onion and behind each layer is an evil spirit. So I'll give you an example. Let's just say uh, Freddie gets saved and let's just picture, we'll call him Freddie the onion to make it real simple. Uh, yeah. Let's say he's got a really bad pornography addiction. He cries out to God, please set me free. I repent. And he, and he disconnects his internet and does everything he can in his power to get off it. And then um, someone comes to him and says, in the name of Jesus, you spirit of lust and perversion, you come out. The demons come out because he's repented, right? Yeah. Now that's one layer of the onion gone. Now that guy can go, thank God Jesus delivered me. And they'll, they'll tell the story for the next 20 years, not realizing that was only one layer of the onion. You got 27 layers left. Mm -hmm. And then uh, God, this happened to me. God started knocking on the door of my heart. Hey, there's another layer called pride and you haven't dealt with it yet. You're still housing a spirit of pride because you haven't let Jesus become the uh, Lord of your life in that particular area of humility. So I had to renounce and repent of pride, and the, the, that layer was broken away. And then when the layer is broken away, the demon's able to come out. Then I had to repent and renounce jealousy, and then I was able to get delivered from the spirit of jealousy. So you first have to make the sin your enemy, because the Bible says God will deliver you from your enemies. In many places of the Old Testament, it says God will deliver you from your enemies, but nowhere in the Bible does it say God is going to deliver you from your friends. Yeah. Thank you for joining us here at The Narrow Gate. We would love to have you subscribe and rate our podcast if you are listening on Apple Podcasts to help other like-minded listeners find us. The Narrow Gate is now on Apple, Pandora, Google Podcasts, as well as Amazon Music and Spotify. If you are watching on YouTube or Rumble, we ask if you could subscribe, like, and leave a comment, whether you enjoyed the show or any comments that you have. We're a community that values the thoughts and views of you, our audience. Iron sharpens iron, and that's the best way for us to grow and learn to serve you better. If you would like to subscribe to our mailing list, just look on the notes below, click the link, and you will be taken to options for what type of updates you're looking for. We are now accepting donations to help with our costs. This is not tax deductible. We do have ongoing costs in addition to the upfront costs that we have paid for the equipment. We will use whatever we receive from you to support the growth of our show give, and give back to our local home churches and other areas of need. Thank you, and now back to our show. So if people are friends with their sin, they're automatically friends with their demons. Mm -hmm. And God can't deliver you from your friends. So in other words, you're basically saying, you know, if somebody genuinely wants something to leave, then, the, you know, it will go. But if somebody yeah. likes what they're doing or they, they, they like the habit or they like the situation that they're in, even yeah. though part of them wants it to go, then that little bit of them liking it is enough for it to stay. Yep. It gives the demon something to hold on to. Bible says okay. that some people have got such a stronghold, the demons have such a stronghold, it literally calls it a stronghold. The Bible says, like, mighty and God are the weapons of warfare for tearing down the strongholds of the enemy. And that word literally means a fortified military position. Like, yeah. uh, if, you, if you build a castle and it's got troops in it, that's a stronghold. Mm -hmm. So um, the enemy builds strongholds in our mind. So, you know, uh, some people will go, I don't want to know anything about God. Why not? Because he took my sister away. She died in this car accident. And God did it. And why didn't he save her? And, and, and then it's like the enemies come in there and spoke into her ear, the demon, and said, God did that. God killed your sister. You know, it's, yeah. it's, it's the reason you didn't get into university is because, you know, God didn't let you. And next thing you know, the, 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 the Satan's built a series of lies in this person's mind and they believed them. And now the enemy has a stronghold in their mind and you can't just say demon come out because this person has literally like layers and layers and layers of, of agreements with the demons. Yeah.
Mm-hmm. And uh, sometimes we'll say that person is PP, and we mean like perfectly possessed, as in like the demon and the person are in perfect agreement, you know, like mm-hmm. then it's like they're married to each other. Mm-hmm. And it's like that person is not getting delivered. Like I've had Satanists say to me, yeah, yeah, you can try and cast my demons out just like as a joke. And I'll give it a crack just to see if they'll manifest. And I'm always shocked. I'm like, wow, really nothing happened. And then I realized they haven't repented. They don't deserve deliverance. And I did a study on it and I realized that Jesus refers to deliverance one time. And he says, why would I give the children's bread to little dogs when somebody wanted their daughter free from demons? Why would I give the children's bread to you? And she's, you know, she's like a pagan devil worshiper. And she says, but even the dogs eat the crumbs that fall from the master's table. Like they, they still get something. And it was a smart thing to say because Jesus turned around and said, okay, she is delivered right now from this moment. And it's pretty incredible that Jesus could just say, your daughter is, has been totally set free. He didn't even go to the house, didn't lay hands, like to just, just literally just declared it. She is healed. She is delivered from this moment. Yeah. And some of the Bibles translate it to she was healed from that moment. And it actually bothers me a bit. And I'll tell you why. Because the word in the Greek is not healed. The word in the Greek is she was sozo from that moment. So S-O-Z-O. Um, and it can mean healed, but it, it just as much means delivered as it means healed. And so when they say she was healed from that moment, I'll tell you why I don't like it. Because it should say she was delivered or set free from that moment. Yeah. Because when a, de- when a demon leaves, the person has not been healed. They've been delivered. Mm-hmm. And having a little tiny translation error like that is a problem because you've got people going, wow, Jesus healed her. Oh, someone had a disease and Jesus healed him. Someone had a demon and Jesus healed him. So they think that the deliverance was a healing miracle by Jesus, but it wasn't. All he did was just use his authority and cast it out. It wasn't a healing. So people are like thinking that they need healing to fix a demon, but a healing prayer never removes a demon. You need to actually take authority and rebuke it quite harshly with authority and, and have it leave. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Oh, we've got so many stories of traveling across Canada and, and, and equipping churches to deliver people mm-hmm. and they'll pray and they'll be so polite that they're actually being polite to the demons. Mm-hmm. And I'll tap on their shoulder and go, I know you're Canadian and you're super polite, but this is not a human being. In fact, it's actually a satanic evil entity that's trying to take this person's soul to hell and destroy their life. So maybe you could be a little bit less polite to it. <laughs> you know? Mm-hmm. Even my own wife's Canadian and I had to say to her, like, honey, you can't speak to a demon that politely and that nicely. You need to say, <laughs> get out. And she's like, but I've never spoken to anyone like that before. She, she was raised in a way where you wouldn't speak to anyone with that tone. Like, please go. (laughs) Yeah. And I was like, I was like, well, this is different. This is a demon. So, you know, you need to get mad at it. And it took me, I don't know, probably 10 to 20 times to to get her to actually do it right. And now she does it great. And everywhere she goes, she tells people the same thing. You got to really rebuke it. And the example we use, which we borrowed from someone like, I think it was Smith Wigglesworth, is if you, you have a dog in front of your house and you say, Oh, you naughty puppy dog, get out of here. It's not going to move. It doesn't even really even know you're talking to it. You know, it's just looking at you thinking you're talking to yourself, maybe you're talking to your wife. What are you even talking about? Because it's kind of dumb. But if you if you happen to know the dog's name, let's say it's uh, no, Frank, and you go, Frank, get out of here. That dog's <laughs> ears, you, you look at its ears, its ears will prick straight up because it yeah. realizes I am being spoken about. And demons are the same. If you say, Jezebel, come out, and there's a Jezebel demon there. It's the ears break up, and it and it starts to respond, and it goes, you know, how did you know I was here? You know. Yeah. It's it's sort of like you know I would say when Kayla's got her you know, hands in a cookie jar or something like that, and I'm like, Kayla, what are you doing over there? Exactly. It's like she looks at me with her with her hand halfway in like the 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 cracker box or whatever, and then she puts it down. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Yeah. So they respond. They respond to authority, but um, some people get the wrong idea, and they're screaming their lungs out at the demons, saying, yeah. "Get out!" And I say, "Hold on, hold on. I didn't say that you needed a lot of volume. I just said you need to speak with authority." And uh-huh. you no, know, I actually tell people get a little bit angry at it. And the truth is, you don't really have to be angry at the demon. 
But the reason I say that is because it's basically the simplest way to get them to speak with kind of like an authority tone. So I'll say, get a little bit angry at the devil and tell it to come out. And the person will go, come out, you devil. And I'm like, perfect. That's perfect. Keep doing that. <laughs> yeah. That's good. That's so not the anger. It's not the anger that they're responding to. It's the yeah. certainty in the voice and the authority. Yeah. Oh, and you don't have to lay hands on the demon to cast it out either. You, yeah. You know, teaching this. It's, it's verbal. The demon responds to the command. Come out, you devil. Now. Yeah. It's sort of like, you know, I guess this would be different than, you know, healing, like laying on of hands, yeah. which is a little bit different than deliverance because, you know, and Jesus would always, you know, command an authority um, without even having to put his hands on anybody and it, and it would leave. And the same with, you know, the apostles and stuff like that. They would command yeah. an authority and it would leave. They didn't have to yeah. put their hands on anybody. I know, but why people get confused is because the Bible says lay your hands on the sick and they shall recover. And so there's mm -hmm. multiple scriptures that say, lay your hands on the sick, but none of them says, lay your hands on the demon. Yeah. So uh, the reason I say that is because people confuse healing with deliverance. They think it's yeah. It's totally different. It's, it's exactly. So, so what you're saying in general is if it's a demon, there's a definite manifestation because the authority of Jesus in you know, like in you or in me or who's ever in Christ, that authority that's in them, you know, that, you know, with the Holy Spirit, it, you know, it causes the demon to shudder. It causes the demon yeah. to shake. And yeah. because of that, it's sort of like a sure sign that there's a demonic possession going on. We thank you for listening to part one of the One and Done Gospel and Generational Curses with Matthew Morton. There is plenty more to discuss in the next episode, so please stand by, listen, and wait, because there is more in part two. Thank you.